Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Welcome to the book of Romans. Rome is where this letter was sent to by the Apostle Paul. And some people say that this was Paul's greatest work. And um, it certainly is full of theological truths. And it's laid out so logically that I have read that some law schools even use it to teach their students how to put together an argument in court. And so the book of Romans is where we begin today in chapter 1, verse 1. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 1 of chapter 1. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Paul had been handpicked by Jesus to be an apostle. He was called to be an apostle, and he was separated unto the gospel of God. And the apostle Paul was also chosen by the Holy Spirit to write more of the New Testament than anyone else. But you know what? Paul never became arrogant as we see in this very first verse where he calls himself a servant. That's what he thought of himself. He was just a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, I think that's why he was used so much by Jesus. Jesus uses Christians who have a servant's heart. Jesus uses Christians who do not seek great things for themselves but do all things for the glory of God. Verse 2, speaking of the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, back in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, God promised that he would send a Savior to pay for the sins of man. Verse 3, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Jesus is one person with two natures. He has a human nature, and he has a divine nature. So it must be 50-50. Nope. Jesus is 100% God, as much God as the Father and the Holy Spirit, and he is 100% man, as much a human being as you and I. His human nature came from the royal line of David through his mother Mary, and of course his divine nature came from God the Father. Jesus was always God, for eternity passed before he became a man. Verse 4, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection... Of Jesus Christ was the Father's way of saying, Jesus is my Son. You can believe everything that He said, because if He would have sinned, if He would have said one thing that was wrong, if He would have told one lie, then He would have sinned and death would have kept Him in the grave. Verse 5 Through Him, through Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Obedience comes from faith. Trying to obey God without putting your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation is a waste of time as far as God is concerned. It doesn't get you anywhere. This is the order which, which has been ordained by God right here. First you repent of your sins and you put your faith in the cross of Christ, which paid for your sins. And then you live out your faith with good works. That's the way it needs to be if you're going to be saved. We are saved by faith, by grace. The Bible says that not of ourselves. The Bible says it is a gift of God, not of works. But the Bible also says that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, serve Jesus out of appreciation for his death on the cross, 
which purchased your forgiveness and reconciliation to the Father. 6. Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. If you belong to Christ because you trust in his death on the cross, then the reason you are doing that is because God called you to be one of his own people. God wanted you. And that's why you felt the need to trust Christ when you first did that. And it's why you're trusting Christ right now. It is the call of God on your life. It all begins with him. People have a free will to choose Jesus or reject him. And yet the Bible is clear that if one does choose to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, it is only because God has called them to do it. If we understand that, then we will appreciate God more than ever because we will realize that without him and his grace working in us, we would never have turned to Christ and received eternal life in the first place. Verse 7. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. A saint is someone who has repented of their sins and asked Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior. We don't become saints by being good enough. We become saints by trusting in Jesus Christ and receiving him into our life as Lord and Savior, knowing that he alone is good enough to reconcile us to the Father. Verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. The Roman Christians lived for Jesus so much that anyone who ever heard of them heard of their great faith in Christ as well. One always went with the other. They were not ashamed to be connected to the Lord Jesus Christ in a world where Jesus was not popular. You know, the real Jesus has never been popular with the world. Never. It, the, when the world says, oh, we just love Jesus, it, they've created a Jesus in their own image, in their own likeness, because all you would have to say today is that the real Jesus condemns homosexuality and people would hate him. Most people would hate him. The real Jesus condemns drunkenness. The real Jesus said, you're forgiven, but go your way and sin no more. And the real world, I should say the world, would hate them because they don't want to give up their sin. It's only when preachers preach a watered-down Jesus that the world loves them. But the Roman Christians had great faith. They were known for it. And great faith will cause you to live for Jesus even when no one else is. Great faith will cause you to live for Jesus even if it costs you something. And I think the Apostle Paul was the poster boy of great faith in the New Testament. Well, I shouldn't just limit it to him, all the apostles and many other Christians throughout the, the church age, of course. Verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. God deserves total dedication from every single Christian. The Apostle Paul served him with his spirit. That means deep down inside, that was Paul's greatest desire. And when something is your greatest desire, more often than not, you're going to do it. And that's what God deserves. He deserves that kind of dedication from every single one of us. God does not demand perfection from Christians in order to be saved, but he sure does deserve protection from Christians because they have been saved. 10. Making request, if by some means, now at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. In the will of God. It doesn't matter how badly we may want something. 
if it isn't God's will, then we shouldn't try to force it. Our first choice will be a terrible one if we rebel against God to get it. Verse 11 and 12, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. If a Christian is under the control of the Holy Spirit as they should be, then they're going to have a positive effect on other Christians. Good Christians like to be around other good Christians because they make each, each other better Christians. And that's what a true Christian wants more than anything else. 13. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. Sometimes the good things that we want to do only happen after a prolonged struggle. And those are some of the most difficult situations because we know that what we are asking for, what we would like to do, seems to line up so perfectly with Scripture. And we can understand if we don't get things that are contrary to Scripture. There's something wrong with us if we want them. But just because something is right doesn't mean you won't have to persevere before you are able to receive it or do it. If something is right, then it is worth enduring difficult times and disappointment to get. 14. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. In other words, God says that every single human being in the entire world deserves to be told how to be saved. We owe it to them. They haven't done anything to earn it, but according to God's grace, we owe it to them because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why we owe it to every single human being to be told how to be saved. Everyone should have the opportunity to hear the gospel of salvation which comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And we Christians are called by God to tell everyone about Jesus Christ, to tell everyone that Jesus is the only way to heaven and the only way to avoid hell. If that were not the case, he would not have told us to proclaim the message of salvation to everyone in the world. If there was another way, why tell everyone? 15. So as much as, in, as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. There is something wrong with any so-called Christian who isn't eager to see the word of God spread so that lost souls can be saved and so that saved souls can be sanctified. Where Where's your priorities, if that's you? Where's your concern for what Jesus wants, if that's you? When I got saved, my main concern was to do the will of God, and my greatest desire was to see others avoid hell, as I just did by receiving Christ. And I'm nothing special. You know, according to Scripture, spreading the word of God is normal for Christians. At least it should be. Worldliness has taken control of the soul of the Christian who doesn't care, who doesn't give so that the Word of God can spread. Worldliness has taken control of their soul in the place of the Holy Spirit. And that wasn't the case with the Apostle Paul. He was eager to get the Word of God to everyone, including those in Rome. 